We've talked of the material, we've talked of the political, we've talked of entertainment and art and cinema. Next up, we're going to talk about faith and reason and its place in society and the various forms that faith is taking in the modern world. We have Jaggi Vasudev, Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev. <laughs> the head of Isha Foundation that has centers across 160 cities across the world, 200, two, 2 million volunteers, and a, and a following that is passionate and urban and mystical. With him, we have Javed Akhtar, lyricist, scriptwriter, legendary man of cinema, but also somebody who is a committed and fierce rationalist. Both of them will be talking about the space for faith and reason in our society. Please welcome them on stage. Uh, Sadhguru, you have a passion for snakes, SUVs, bikes, helicopters, adventure travel, you have a flair for entrepreneurship, your passion is the construction business, and you're a Satguru. Can you spell out what is the core philosophy uh, of your foundation, of your practices, and how do these two aspects of you sit together? Good evening, everyone. First of all, let me correct that. Uh, I have no passion for snakes or <laughs> SUVs or helicopters. I'm just passionate about life and just about anything that I do. <laughs> it's not about this or that. I do not know how to do anything without absolute involvement. So passion is a word that people attach but it's just that just about anything that I do, I do not know how to do it without absolute involvement because it's only with involvement one knows life. It doesn't matter whether you're doing business or art or music, spirituality, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're not involved, you'll miss it all. So, I'm just involved. These are all names that people attach. There are these only a few things that people have seen <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'll come back to the strand of materialism sitting well with uh, spirituality. But before that, you know, you say that what you… your philosophy is not even a teaching, it's a technology and it just works. W what is that? Can you articulate it and what does it mean when there ha doesn't have to be personal endeavor, one doesn't have to be a learner but you can just achieve a technology? So this… Is, there is no philosophy because generally philosophies are just fantastic explanations for those aspects of life which can never be explained. So they essentially, we are here. Whatever you think about it is just your thought. But the fact of it is, if you look at this, as a human being, this human mechanism is the most sophisticated technology on the planet, isn't it? Whatever other gadgets that we have, they all come out of it, out of this one. This is the most sophisticated mechanism. You see today people are deeply engrossed in their iPhones, but what about I? This is the thing, this is the gadget. If you pay enough attention to this, you would understand how to operate this at its highest possible mode. So the whole process that we refer to as spiritual is just this, so that this mechanism attains its fullest capability and possibility that it doesn't just operate in a minimalistic way. So, that's why it's a technology. Philosophies have happened because of the misunderstanding of the technology. Otherwise, essentially, only technologies were transmitted. You must, if you look back and see, there were no teachings in this country. There were only methods. There were only? Methods. How to do it? How to make this happen at its highest possible level? So, once we enter this sphere, being a subjective dimension of life. You have a body, you have a mind, you have emotions, you have energies supporting these… all these three. So when we handle all these four dimensions, some of it may not come under the purview of rudimentary 
logic and reason that a lot of people subscribe to. Because of that rudimentary level of reasoning, they think it's beyond reason. It is very much in reason. If you probe into it, we can go into it. <laughs> yeah. But um, in fact, you know, b before we go further with that, in the past you said yes that, you know, in India there's always been methods, there hasn't been teachings. But the purpose of spirituality was to some extent to disconnect people from desire, from materialism, uh, to understand the limits of that. Uh, why is it that with the Isha Foundation's philosophy, just self-actualization is, is, is the goal, you know, uh, expressing yourself to the maximum you can, rather than to understand the finiteness of that? See, uh, this understanding that spiritual means you have to dissociate with desire, let's understand it this way. If you desire for food, if you desire for money, if you desire for a piece of land on this planet, if this is considered greed, now you want to know the very source of creation. This is super greed, isn't it? So where is the question of dissociating? It is evolution of desire, not dissociating with desire. Your desire has evolved. When you are a five-year-old child, what you desired for completely fell away when you were ten. What you desired for when you were ten completely was meaningless when you are fifteen. What you desired as fifteen when you are thirty doesn't make any sense. So your desire is evolving. If you evolve very slowly, you will go at this pace. If you go beyond your experience and think beyond and reason beyond where you are, right now as you sit here, if you understand that after all you and me are mortal, whatever we may do, when you understand you're mortal, naturally the question of what is beyond, where did I come from, where will I go, this is naturally in the purview of human intellect. See, if you are not given ready-made answers by somebody, it is very, very natural that every human intellect will inquire, where did I come from, where will I go, what is the nature of my existence? So, this is not dissociating from desire, this is just evolving your desire to a new possibility. Uh, I'm going to bring Javed Saab into the conversation in a bit, Javed Saab, I just want to probe this a little more. I'm in no hurry, take <laughs> okay. your own time. Uh, I'll finish it. Uh, Sadhguruji, Javid Saab, this is called theatrical timing. You've got to clap for saying nothing, actually. <laughs> um, Sadhguruji, you know, we, we've called our session Five Stars Fixes because... And, and the reason I'm saying this is because perhaps it's something that one doesn't understand, that to be a part of your course, which actually a lot of my friends have taken, and I must admit that it does transform them, the breathing techniques, they come back calmer people, but it costs a lot. How... <laughs> is your spirituality, your technique, your old technology is not available for the poor? I want you to understand this. Seventy percent of Isha Foundation's work is in rural India, where it's one hundred percent free. I'm just robbing you to keep that seventy percent active. <laughs> I couldn't get it. I missed that. So, you need to understand this. We charge one way in the United States, another way in UK, another way in Lebanon, another way in Sri Lanka, another way in India, one way in Mumbai, one way in the ashram, one way in a local town and in the village, it's free. You've got to give your accountants to the government. <laughs> I will. <laughs> it is already there. And above all, the volume of work our volunteers are doing is all funded by this. The amount of medical work, free medical work that's happening, education, we are involved with about thirty-six thousand children right now actively. We are the largest ecological movement in the country. Nowhere in the history of independent India has this happened in any state. Tamil Nadu's green cover has gone up 7.2 percent in a matter of eight years with seventeen million living trees that we have planted. So, where does money come from all this? No, but, but Sadhguru, that doesn't answer my question because I, I, I… of course you do a lot of rural outreach and one knows that. I, no, was, those asking, are, those, I was asking about Those your... who do not have money should come and take it in the village, it's free. No, I, I was talking about your… <laughs> See, now the thing is five-star culture, 
People want air-conditioned rooms, people want all the comfort and they want it free. How does it come? Somebody has to pay for it. No, no, Sadhguru, I just want to finish my question. It's not about you charging the rich, which is fine for their well-being. Uh, I was asking whether your breathing techniques, your technology of, of uh, self-actualization, whether that is available to the poor, your meditative techniques, you know, not your rural outreach. No, no, I'm talking about the meditative techniques. All the inner engineering programs in the villages are free, one hundred percent free. Okay. Um, one other question which is about your central philosophy is to do with yoga and with breathing techniques, but there is also another… I would like to dissociate from that word philosophy <laughs> Okay. <laughs> your technology is connected with breathing techniques. Um, but you also believe in, in past life, um, you know, one of my colleagues spent a week with you uh, at the foundation and wrote a, a big piece and he said that there people feel that they can see disembodied selves, that, you know, uh, your wife you felt was a sister from the past life. Um, you know, we've had James Randi here who was shooting through this kind of uh, faith system and you said very, something very interesting to my colleague, you know, when he was being skeptical about this whole idea of past life and seeing spirits that are disembodied, you said, the reason you disbelieve all this is because your mind is in the UK in Greenwich Mean Time, you know, and not in India. So is it really about conditioning of minds? It is not about conditioning of minds. Let's look at it this way. When you were born, you were not made like this, isn't it? You were so small. Now this much happened, how? So what you call as my body is an accumulation, yes? Is an accumulation? It's an accumulation. It's just a piece of planet that you accumulate through the food that you eat. What you call as my mind is a heap of impressions which you also accumulate over a period of time. So your body is an accumulation, your mind is an accumulation. What you accumulate, at the most you can claim it's yours, but you cannot say it's me, isn't it? It's like the five percent of the universe that we understand now, one of the scientists were telling us No, about no, that. no, I'm not talking about that. See, right now, whatever you accumulate, you can claim it's yours but you cannot claim it's me, isn't it? What you accumulate cannot be you, isn't it? So you gathered your body, you gathered the whole volume of your mind. So what the hell are you? Never been looked at, isn't it? You're making assumptions. So your personality, your ideologies, everything picked up, everything accumulated. You can accumulate and keep it and use it, but you can never claim it's mine. Everybody should get this now. If you don't get it now, you'll get it from the maggots. So, Sadhguru, you, you, had a, you had a Mount of Sinai moment when you were young, when you felt that you were instantly transformed. You don't speak of it much, but you also, f were, you know, you also told people that you would die at forty-two, but you didn't. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> but. That again puts all this realm into, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody in the middle zone. People who, who know me well always tease me about how I try to be a rationalist, but I always believe in the paranormal. But, you know, there is no precision to it. So how, you know, how, how do you square with that? What would your devotees say if you said something, you know, the paranormal is not empirical? See, these are all words. We keep on inventing more words for all this. This is just life. In the sense, now uh, when you talk about past lives, present lives, I always tell people, do not ever believe these things. At the same time, do not be a fool and disbelieve it because belief and disbelief means just this. You believe something or you disbelieve something essentially means you are not straight enough to admit that you do not know. You have not understood the immensity of I do not know because I do not know is a tremendous possibility. Only if you see I do not know, the possibility of knowing ever arises in you. So this must be clearly demarcated. See, the moment you say I am religious, you refer to yourself as a believer. The moment you refer to somebody as spiritual, you refer to him as a seeker. Who can seek? Only one who has realized that he does not know can seek. If he thinks he knows, why will he seek? Okay. Let me come to you, Javed Sahib. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Now Sir, starts her seeking. Javed Sahib, you have to not be theatrical with me. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we live in a country yeah. of great faiths. You are part of a creative uh, space that very often expresses stories uh, through faith. You're a committed rationalist. You know, if we see the finiteness of faith, would you accept that there's a finiteness to just reason as well? First of all, I think before starting any discussion, one should always decide on the meaning of words. Maybe you mean something by faith and I am understanding something else. What is faith? And what is the difference between faith and belief? I believe I am in Goa. I believe there is a place called North Pole. I believe that Ethiopia is a poor country. I believe that Germany is a rich country. Is it my faith? Why it is not my faith? I'll tell you why it is not my faith and why it is my belief, because it is reasonable. Anything, any belief which is devoid of logic, reason, rational, evidence, witness, that is faith. Anything which is devoid of all the logic, all the reason, all the rational, all the witness, all the evidence, that is faith. And I really wonder what is the difference between faith and stupidity? Because that is, it has, stupidity has the same definition. <clears throat> I am willing to, I am willing to accept belief, but it has to have some rational, some reason. If you don't have any, you disarm me from reason, logic. Now, when you say that whatever a mind is, is accumulated, my body is accumulated, that is not me. It is like saying that as long as you can peel the onion, you are not finding the onion. These skins are the onion. This accumulation, this accumulation is me. If you eradicate this accumulation, I don't exist. That's Jav all. Javid Saab. I think I should respond to this. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <coughs> now, uh, you being in Nagpur right now, for sure is your belief. But you I'm being in Goa right now is a reality, which you better grasp. Sadhguruji, just give me a moment. Uh, there's a reverberation here and we can't really I hear can't. each other. Could you just turn the speakers towards us? Or, or maybe give uh, Sadhguruji another mic because we can't... Not that I can't him. understand him, I can't even hear him. <laughs> it, uh... I, I don't know about the battle between faith and reason, but wit certainly has its place in society. <laughs> Probably the microphones are arranged in such a way because anyway, even if you hear, you may not, not understand. <laughs> Thank for the compliment, sir. Yeah, <laughs> Guys, three. The yeah, sir, it'll have come on. So, uh, yeah, that's better. now I'll repeat for you, you believing that you're in Nagpur is for sure belief, but you're in Goa is a reality, whether you believe it or you don't believe it, that's how it is. So there is a difference between reality and belief. If you think whatever you believe is true, I want you to understand, we can make you believe just about anything. If you work hard enough on you, we can make you believe anything. And when you believe just about anything, that is what we are referring to as faith or it's passing off as religion or faith. We'll come to this. Now… No, just a second. I'll have Javid to… Sir, no, I'll may, have I, to. may I… May I… No, no, may no, I remain no, the no lecture. Javid I'll sir. get the point. Sorry. Javid I sir. have to answer this. No Javid lecture. Sir, let me be the moderator. 
One point, Alam. Yes, but let, let but me. I, I will. I will. No parivachan. I will. May I? Our belief may can I, be wrong. May I Our retain? Our belief can be wrong. So Maybe based on wrong logic. The people wrong in the logic. audience, may it I retain? Can be corrected. But faith cannot be corrected because it is not based on any logic. May I retain the aesthetics? May I retain the aesthetics of this session? I really don't need anybody telling me that I'm not going to let him talk. I will let him talk. Can we please keep the aesthetics of this alive? So, so this whole uh, presumption and the way this is going is coming from a certain fundamental presumption. Because even when I met ja Javed Sahib last time, he was telling me that some guru told him not to use his mind. I do not know which guru said this, one thing is clear, the advice has been taken seriously. <laughs> Javed Sahib, I… Why have you taken him seriously? Why have you taken him seriously? I promise you, Guruji, I have never taken any guru seriously. <laughs> I, have, I have not taken any guru seriously, I promise you that. In the rich tradition, in the rich tradition of the argumentative Indians, yeah. It remained with the argument, it never got personal, both of you. So, I just wanted to come back, Javed Sahib, to this whole issue of, of the finiteness of, of reason. You know, we just saw Ramanujan, for instance. Uh, he, he was intuitive, he didn't know how he arrived at, at that math, but he arrived at it. I have absolutely no argument with the fact that reason is the highest condition of man as we understand it. But is there not space for something beyond our empirical understanding? Of course, yes, of course there is. But there is no halo around it. There is nothing like a spiritual about it. When you look at the fan, and that the fan is running on full speed, you can't see the blades. It doesn't mean there are no blades. You know, when you think very quickly, you may not see the reason, but when you sit back and analyze it, if the conclusion is right, then there is a logical uh, step behind it. You have not seen it at that moment because your conscious mind is not the only mind. You have many parts of the mind. You lose a key and you try to remember you can't and then you're talking to somebody else and some, so, uh, suddenly you remember where you have kept the key because a part of your brain was working on it. So brain is a very complicated machine. Mind is the most sophisticated computer on, in this universe at the moment. So, you have to understand the functioning. If Ram Nujam understood it, he understood it in a language which he knew. Why he did not understand in Chinese or Hebrew? That is not possible. Ultimately, what will come, will come from your mind. You are nothing but your mind. And if that is eradicated, you don't exist. But Ramanujan actually believed that the goddess was giving him that intuition. Uh, how do you uh, reconcile that? Would you say that he was somebody... I mean, after all, he was a human being, so what? He couldn't be right all the time. <laughs> yeah. Sadhguru, before I come back to you, Javed Sahib, an another function of faith is, you know, in its, in its refined form, not as religion, not as public religion, but as faith, can sometimes be the impulse for also the most noble of human endeavor, whether it's oh, in yes. art... There's no doubt about it. The faith can make you do wonderful things and the worst thing possible. These suicide bombers are people of faith. If they would have been reasonable, they wouldn't have done that. But, but equally, Javed sir... So, faith is a blind power. Faith paralyzes your mind. And now you are capable of doing something exceptionally good and something exceptionally bad, but you are out of control. You can go either way. What about the ultra-rationalists, the communists, the Stalinist regimes? They, no, 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 they are not rationalists, they are communists. They have a faith. <laughs> they believe in communism. They, I am not only against religion or spiritualism, which is the debris of religion. I am, I am against faith. If communism is your faith, then you are as bad as a religious person. That's well put, sir. So what do you live with then? If you don't live with a belief system, what do you live with? Faith? I, you know, you're talking of extremities, but what... How about, how about common sense?
will do. <laughs> It'll do for the moment. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to come back, Javed sir, with a scientific question for you, which is about stories. Human beings need stories to live with. You know, we've met a lot of scientists, a lot of astrophysicists. Even in science, there is the idea of the story. Um, I don't know much about it, and if you question me too much, I'll falter. But, you know, the universe, uh, Professor Ganesan was telling us that we understand only 5% of the universe. There's 95% we don't understand. And we both met Richard Dawkins in Jaipur earlier this year, and he was suggesting that outside of this universe, there could be multiverses. Now, that is not something we know. It is a belief in, in something that no, is... No, it is not a belief. It is a guess. Maybe, maybe not. No, it's a story you live with. Why can't we live with other stories in the meantime, which give people a sense of you certitude see, in their life, a sense of uh, solace? Nick, you see, uh, what is the problem that as long as you have curiosity, as long as, and he said very rightly, and I totally agree with him, that you should be humble enough to accept that there are many things that you don't know. And only then you will search. What is wrong with religions? That they know everything. They can tell you how to make a universe in four easy lessons. They, can, they will tell you where were you were before you were born, and where will you go after your death, and so on. So they have all the answers. That is the problem. Sadhguruji, that's a, that's, you know, when you said that essentially the spiritual person is a seeker, why is it that gurus give the answers? I don't know which guru gave an answer, I haven't met one like that. If you met all the wrong ones, I couldn't help it. <laughs> no guru ever gave an answer. Gurus only give methods to deepen your process I asked you life. what your method was, sir. Now, we're talking about thought and the… Uh, the event itself is called think. So let me… let's just look at this. Your thought. Your thought is essentially coming from the information that is already there in your mind, the data that is there in your mind. It's complex, but it is within the limited data that you have. How did you gather this data? This data you gathered through the agencies of five senses, by seeing, by hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. This is the way it's gone into you. These are the five instruments which are taking in all the data. In your wakefulness and sleep, this data is being gathered all the time. Even in your sleep, in deep sleep, if I say something, we can hypnotize you and make you remember that actually. Because even in sleep you're recording. But it is only through these five senses. These five senses are not reliable in the sense if I touch this table, it would… my hand will tell me it's cool. But if I lower my body temperature and touch it, my hand will tell me it's warm. So it doesn't say anything about that. It only tells me the information that is necessary for my survival. If survival is all you're seeking, these five senses are okay. But if you're seeking something beyond survival, you need to expand the dimension of your perception. So the whole spiritual process is about how to expand your perception because only what you perceive is life, rest is just imagination. If you want to be in touch with reality, you have to enhance your perception. And just assuming what… see, these things have happened across the history. When people believed the planet is flat, somebody said it's round, he got killed, okay? Now everybody thought, they can only walk. Somebody says, I can fly. He was almost killed. So this has happened continuously because people believing whatever I do not know cannot exist is the crown of ignorance. Javed sahab, that's… that's a volley that I hand to you. You know that at every… at every point in history, the limits of reality has been pushed by those who imagine or have faith in something that doesn't yet exist? Not at all, not at all. First of all, let's not… I mean, the first thing a spiritualist will do, will try to shake your confidence in the five senses that you have. <laughs> Only then he can control you. Now, if you think that you will believe on any other thing, then take a person, do an operation on him, 
disconnect him with his brain and then let us see how he expands his personality. <laughs> Whatever expansion happens, happens in your mind. And you cannot undermine it. And whoever suggests that that is to be undermined is playing a very dangerous game with you. <laughs> because then you will not have any discretion. How will you decide whether whatever he's saying is right or wrong? And whatever he's saying, is you, he's using his brain. He doesn't want you to use your brain. <laughs> from where this thought has come? Has it come from where, from where it has come? It has come from the mind. Even if you think that the mind is not everything, that too has come from the mind. If you don't trust mind, how do you trust this thought? Okay. But Javed sir, yeah. uh, you said the five senses, as a writer, as an artist, as a human being. Yeah. Don't you sometimes have a sixth sense about something? No, no, please understand. You see, there are, like between countries, there are no man lands. Between India and Pakistan, between India and China, there are no man lands. Same way, in your, between your subconscious and between your conscious mind, there is a no man land. And what happens that if you rely only on your current thinking, on your it, 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 mind and brain is also like a house. Your mind, your conscious mind is your living room. But then you have other rooms, you have attics, you have bedrooms, you have basements within your brain. When you relax and you allow the other part of your mind to take over, then your conscious mind and your subconscious, they work together in partnership and ultimately something comes which comes from you, comes from your mind, but from that part of mind which more often than not you are not using. That's all. But it is the mind, ultimately. <laughs> now, if, uh, can I, we are talking yeah. about stories, can I say a story? Stories. Can I tell yeah. a story? Yeah, sure, please. But just speak a bit louder. Yes. On a certain day, a lady went to sleep. In her sleep, she had a dream. In her dream, she saw a hunk of a man standing there, staring at her. He started coming closer and closer. He came so close, she could even feel his breath. And she trembled, not in fear. And then she asked, what will you do to me? The man said, well lady, it's your dream. Now, what happens in your mind is just essentially your dream. Just being in a constant state of flowing thoughts all the time, twenty-four hours, thoughts are flowing. This is not this does not signify intelligence. This suggests diarrhea, mental diarrhea. Constantly, it is on and on and on. Now, if one has made an effort, one has strived to look beyond the firmament of the mind, one would know other dimensions. Simply denying that nothing like that exists because I do not know it is… Uh, I don't know, it doesn't need comments. Sadhguruji, but you just said that the five senses are unreliable, but just to yes. come back to the detail… No, five senses uh, being unreliable, let me come to this. Right now, what your vision, visual sense understands as light, many other creatures on the planet understand it as darkness, isn't it so? You sit with an owl and start an argument as to which is light and which is darkness, you'll end up with an endless argument. So who is right? You insist you are right, but that is the whole problem. People insisting that they are right is a whole problem on the planet. But Sadhguru, if, if the whole point of uh, your technology is to make people actualize themselves, why in the modern world is there still cult creation? Why does your photograph adorn every devotee's ho or every practitioner's home? Why do they not just take the technology and become independent spirits themselves? See, uh, you don't mind. If a… you don't mind if a rock star's picture is in somebody's house, okay? But people he, don't kill no, no, for rock come stars. To this. He lives a bad life, he is drugged out, but you don't mind. If a film star's picture is there, it doesn't matter. If the twelve girls from the Kingfisher calendar adorns your house, you do not matter. <laughs> but 
you have something with me, what is the problem? <laughs> no, I'll tell you what the problem <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, uh, I'll, Javed Sahib, I'll come to you, but I'll, I'll tell you what my problem with that is, is that by and large, what Javed Sahib was saying earlier, is that with the following of a guru, even if the guru doesn't want it, there is a giving up of oneself, there's a subjugation of one's own thinking to a, you know, to a guru, and that takes people sometimes to very dark places. You know, you're willing to kill for a guru, you may not be willing to kill for the film star. But they do. They don't. <laughs> they do. You come in Tamil Nadu and see people will kill for the film star. <laughs> My bad. I need you I to think argue. You are no, being, I'm not finished. You are, you are being unfair. Uh, on, in, on this point, I'm on his side. Oh my God. Okay. I'll tell you why. You know, if a film star is successful and is having a wonderful time, you don't resent. If a rock star is having a wonderful time and he's doing good in his vocation, in his profession, you don't resent. If a guru is doing good in his profession, he's having a good time, why should you resent? You should not. Definitely, what's your problem? Sure. Now this is… this is the I operation of rationality. Huh? The equation should hold I mean, good. Let, <laughs> let them have good time. Javid, uh, Sadhguruji, one quick question, I think my colleague is going to ring the bell any minute. You know, I saw a film recently in America made by a young man and it's called The True, Sto the True Story of a Fake Guru. He dressed himself up as a guru and he went and he met a whole lot of people. He listened to their sorrows, he listened to their stories, he put three pictures in front of them, he brought them into this sense of ecstasy and elation and they began to transform themselves. They completely believed in him and they began to follow him. They felt that they arrived at a safe harbor. At the end of the film, and they're being filmed through this whole journey, at the end of it, he reveals himself. <laughs> you, you know about it. Yes. He reveals himself, he's just a young man from, from yes. Phoenix. What is the answer to that, uh, Sadhguru? See, this is why I want you to make a distinction between faith and a spiritual process. Faith is just a set of beliefs. Spiritual process begins only when you realize that you do not know the fundamentals of your existence. A seeking begins. When a seeking begins and you find your sense organs and your logic only takes you to a certain point and it's not willing to help you beyond that, then when you come to a dead end, you know there is something beyond but you are at a dead end, then you will want to know a process. So then somebody who has experienced it will offer a process, this is all it is. Now in society it might have found all kinds of distortions. You're picking up a bad apple and talking about apples. Sadhguru, consumption in this universe, in this earth is really becoming something unsustainable. What kind of spirituality is it that does not talk about the finite end of consumption? You know, even as a even as a method, even as a process, that is not part of Isha Foundation at all. See, we are always trying to curtail human aspirations, it'll never work. If I tell somebody, don't smoke, don't do this, don't do that, they will not do that. They'll anyway continue to do it or other kinds of compuls compulsions will take them over. But if you teach them a method through which they're able to manage the chemistry of who they are, Today there is substantial medical and scientific evidence, it is no more belief system. There is substantial scientific and uh, medical evidence. Today, research has gone into the University of California, has done an enormous research on the simple Shambhavi Mahamudra, the basic practice that we teach. Three months of practice, your… the neuronal rejuvenation, re rejuvenation in your brain is two hundred and forty-one percent more than the average, okay? There are any number of things like this. Now the chemical soup that you are, you can either make it very blissful or miserable. So if you are blissful by your own nature, then all the compulsiveness will naturally drop. Whether you are going shopping or you are digging up the planet or you are seeking something else, essentially it is just this, a human being is longing to be. A human being is longing to be something more than what he is right now. But if that more happens, he wants more. If you really look at it, a human being cannot settle unless he has all of it. If you want all of it, approaching it 
through physical means is a hopeless means. The desire is fine, but the method is hopeless. So spiritual process means you have offered him the right method, right process for the same desire. Javed Sahib, you wanted to say something? I… I really find it highly amusing. It's very interesting that it is in religion, it is in spirituality. The moment they find something in science which is compatible, they start respecting science. They say, look, now even the science has accepted it. But the moment science is opposing them, then it is not credible at all. And it is the history. There was a question which I missed that time, that we have to understand through spiritualism that why we are in this universe, what are we doing here? Why have we come here? I don't want to uh, comment about anybody else's presence, but Guruji, I know why I'm in this universe and the reason is unprintable. And the reason is? Unprintable. Unprintable. <laughs> it is a pompous question that why I am in this universe. It is a pompous question what I am doing here. Have you ever thought of a mosquito? Why this mosquito is here in this world? <laughs> why this cockroach is here? There is, as far as life quality is concerned, there is no difference between a rodent and a human being, between a mosquito and a human being. The only difference is the mind. And this is the difference they want to eradicate. Uh, obviously, uh, this has no relevance to whatever I'm speaking, it looks like it's not even being heard. So, the thing is, the significant aspect of… The, the significant aspect of human life is that human life is replete with possibilities which other creatures are not capable of. Every other creature on this planet is fulfilled when its survival process is fulfilled. There is something about a human being that it does not settle with survival. What is called as human begins only after survival is taken care of. So the longing to be an endless expansion cannot be settled by the simplicity of thought. Thought is just a product of the data that we have gathered. And whatever you may know, it is still too limited that much is established by science. So about science and spiritual process ever being head-on with each other, such a thing has never happened. It is just that you have not been exposed to the right things. As I said earlier, you eat a bad apple and you make conclusions about all apples. It's an unfortunate reality of one's life. I'm going to have to end it at that. Um, my takeaway from this are two things. One, that in India we've had a glorious tradition of the argumentation between men of faith and men of reason. There were the Navratnas in King Akbar's court. Yeah, I wind up. And, Why do you keep and, saying and, I'm man of faith? And the big takeaway that I think both of them will agree with is that we can first learn to operate with common sense. Thank you so much for listening.